Here we go. Welcome to the Transform with Travel podcast, where we share stories of personal transformation and life lessons through our experiences of traveling and exploring the world. Travel is the ultimate accelerator for personal growth, and it can be the root catalyst for the pivots and plot twists we make in our lives. I'm your host, Kelly Tolliday, and it's my mission to inspire you to live life to its fullest, travel with an open mind and heart, and let the world show you a new perspective. I'm so grateful you're here with us today, so let's dive right in. Happy exploring. All right. Hi, Nikki. Welcome to the pod. I'm so excited to have you join us today. Everyone here, I have Nikki Nee. She is a international yoga and fitness instructor. She's 500 hour registered yoga teacher in the Tantric Hatha Yoga and Meditation lineage, which is the same lineage, the same background in yoga that that I have as well. So I have such a deep reverence and deep respect to the, the learning that you've been through. Nikki masterfully facilitates spaces for people to empower their energy and ultimately their life. She's an Ayurvedic wellness coach, sound healer, dancer, and Reiki practitioner, And she uses these modalities to initiate deep transformation in her clients so they can align with their true nature, have self-love, and the tools to live out their dharma, which I absolutely love. You've created a global community, creating classes for Fabletics Fit, Class Fit Sugar, Hyper Ice, Tonal, and Kinergy, as well as sharing on Oprah's 2020 Vision Tour and virtual seminars with Tony Robbins, which just sounds so insane to be able to say that, (laughs) that you've done that. It's so cool. And Nikki has founded Wavelength Movement, a monthly subscription platform where you can practice with her on demand and on the daily. With a passion for surfing and a love for Mama Ocean, this down-to-earth beam of sunshine will calm your nerves on the mat so you can stay present and confident in the water. Come be a part of the ripple effect. And as a beginner, beginner surfer myself, I absolutely love being able to combine all your passions of using the yoga and the meditation and the mindfulness to be a better steward of the earth and also be a better surfer and be a better person all around. That's what we're all looking for, right? Just being a well-rounded, awesome person. (laughs) So welcome. (laughs) For sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly, for that welcome, for having me on. I'm I'm stoked to be here and chatting with you. Amazing. So Nikki and I got connected in Bali. I was in Changu for an extended period of time and I was trying to find a home studio while I was there. And Nikki was teaching at the practice in Bali, which is a beautiful yoga shala in the center of Changu. And there was a workshop going on at a free workshop at the practice on the Bayus. And for those who don't know anything about the Bayus, they are a concept in yoga that talks about the energetic, I guess, systems or directions that happen within your body. And it's the way in which we systematically design poses in a sequence to be able to bring about certain energetic Mm -hmm. effects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they all have different functions within the physical body as well too. And so this workshop truly changed the course in which I teach my classes. And it's the way in which I view a lot of the ways that I sequence my classes, a lot of the ways in which I really move about my life as well. And Nikki was also there at that workshop. And And I followed you on Instagram and I just have been really following your journey for the last five years, watching you travel all around the world. You've now hosted your first 200 hour teacher training on your own within the Hatha Tantric tradition. My my lineage is, is very similar following along the Isha yoga tradition with Alan Finger. And so I... I, I really love just the way that you've shared your journey. And I would love to kind of see what's happened since then, right? We, we met in Bali and you're back in California. And I'd love to hear like, what brought you to Bali? How did that happen for you? And then where you are now? I know that's a really long story, but, <laughs> but share what you want to share. <laughs> Yeah, you know, just talking about that, it brings you back to almost it feels like a different lifetime ago when five years ago when I was first living in Bali and 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 teaching and starting my deep dive into yoga and spirituality and all the the fun things that come with that. And, you know, it was really a full circle moment for me to lead that teacher training a few months ago with my colleague Kelly to go back to Bali. And, you know, it was like as a student sitting up like just wide eyed and bushy tailed looking at my teachers and my mind being blown by these teachings and philosophies and everything that I was learning. And, you know, there was a part of me even then that knew I want to I want to be the one sharing this one day. 
I want to lead retreats one day, you know, and it felt like this pipe dream that was so far in the future. And I've been back from Bali for about five years now. And so to have been able to now led retreats, taught the teacher training, it's pretty wild how when we come into alignment, like with our purpose, it just starts to all unfold. So I don't necessarily want to say easy because it required quite a lot of effort, but it, in a sense, easy. You know, I felt like a lot of my life, I wasn't quite aligned with what I was meant to be doing. And while I was good at a lot of different things, dance, makeup, performing, fitness, all of that stuff, it was like, is, you know, when you're like good at something, you think that you should be doing it, but it wasn't it, you know? So, yeah. so finding this, this alignment with, with spirituality, with, you know, being a space holder, being a teacher, it was, it's just like, oh, it's all coming together. And so while five years ago can seem very long, it also went by really quickly. And, you know, my first call to Bali, which I think a lot of people get that same call to go to Bali, to not just study yoga, but just to find a a deeper connection with themselves. And I've always said that my first teacher training, the, what I learned the most, the big takeaway was how to love myself. Mm. And that is a huge part of what has stemmed in all of the things that I share now through my courses, through my classes, through my retreats. It's, it stems from this ability to, to have self-love. And to have the tools and the capacity and to build that expansion of loving yourself more and more every day and through all of the trials and tribulations and the ebbs and flows that life will always give us. You know, I think that that self-love is really at the the, the foundation. It's that, that cornerstone of understanding how to trust yourself more, understanding how to be confident more. And when we have all of that, then what we really want to be doing in life we do. We we ask for it. We speak up for ourselves. We create boundaries. And I think it makes it really hard to do that when we don't believe that we're worthy of it. So yoga really has has catapulted me into continuing to to love myself more and and being content with where I'm at and what my life is. And yeah, I think Bali is just such a, a magical place to have that time for self-inquiry because Bali is primarily a, a Hindu country, it really aligns with the belief system of yoga. And while you don't need to be Hindu to study and be a yogini or yogi, understanding that that through line of mantra and Sanskrit and the gods and goddesses and having the deities everywhere and this incense in the air of all these offerings that the Balinese people are giving to their gods and you know, it just really plays out this whole just feeling of, I think, what what I know I was searching for, of just feeling more sacred in life and like having that woven in to the day, no matter what you're doing. And it doesn't have to just be on the mat. So I don't know. I think, yeah, I think that my my want so badly to have more confidence in myself, to have my own security in myself at a time when I was really looking to the external world for that. This was maybe seven, eight, nine years ago when I started to realize like, oh, I have a really good hold of my body. I'm a dancer. I've been a professional dancer my whole life. Like I understand my body, but I did not understand my mind. Mm. And I think what a lot of people confuse yoga with is this idea that it's about being flexible in your body. And I truly believe that yoga is, is more about being flexible in your mind. Mm, and having absolutely. that that freedom in your thoughts to to pivot to shift and to bend however life is throwing you around. <laughs> yeah, I think that's such a beautiful way of describing yoga is like yeah, you get bendy on the mat, but you also get bendy in your mind and you get to choose what you pay attention to and you get to choose what you allow yourself to kind of which, which direction you allow yourself to go into because there's so many infinite possibilities for us now these days that it can be overwhelming just to be just to be alive these days. It's overwhelming with all the different decisions and all the things that happen and to be able to be flexible and and go with the flow and surrender. That's what a lot of the practice is. So I really appreciate that perspective of yoga and I appreciate that 
yoga came into your life because you are such a powerful teacher and now you're able to share that with so many people around the world. When you initially went to Bali, was that for your first ever yoga training or did you go to Bali and then decide to do a training? Like what was, what was the first, the chicken and the egg? Like what, what came first? <laughs> Yeah, no, I definitely went to Bali for the first time to do my 200-hour yoga teacher okay. training. The first time that I did it, I had been teaching group fitness, bar, hit, spin, row, like all these different things for a long time. And I, I didn't even go to be a yoga teacher. I was like, oh, no, I've got my gigs going on in LA. Like, we're good. I just want to go because I want to understand the philosophy and like the subtle body. And, you know, so so intrigued about more of all, all of that stuff yeah, of, of yoga, yeah. uh, more so than the, the physical. So I went not, not with the intention to be switching my career into, into yoga. But as we see now, flashing forward seven years from then, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I really love how you talked about Bali how it complemented your yoga teacher training. Cause you can do yoga te teacher trainings all over the world. You can do them at your home. You can mm -hmm. do them online now, but there's something about Bali where the spirituality is woven into the tapestry of their society. It is like you mm -hmm. said, every morning there are little offerings in front of every business, in front of every home, in front of every statue of a deity of a God. They have festivals and ceremonies for everything. I remember there was like a three hour traffic jam because there was a festival for appliances in their homes happening. And they go out and they bless all the appliances in their home. But it is such a reminder that every day, every interaction, everything that happens in your life is a chance to meet the divine, which is such a cornerstone of what Tantra is. What was it about the the training that you specifically went for at the practice, did you know you were going for Hatha Tantric Yoga? Did you show up and you were like, okay, this is, I guess this is the lineage that I'm learning. Like sometimes people do that. They fall into the lineages that they're in. What was that like for you to kind of be in such a powerful, such a powerful sacred island while also learning such a powerful sacred ancient tradition? You know, the, the very first things that I started getting curious about was, was with meditation and with uh, Reiki. So I ended up doing my Reiki one and two trainings, gosh, maybe eight or nine years ago. I was meditating at the same time and the meditation teacher that I had found was also a tantric meditation teacher. Mm. I had no idea what tantra was and it, it really found me. You know, I, re I really feel like tantra had come back to me and been like, hey, remember, remember us? Like, in case you forgot your way a little bit, we're right here, we, re ready for you. Yeah. And, and so, you know, one of my teachers that I was studying meditation with was in Tantra. And so then when I started to look at trainings in Bali, to be honest, like the, uh, the, the main things that I wanted was to be by the beach so that I could surf. Yep. Like, like, no joke. Like, that was the big thing that I was looking for. I looked up a lot of different teacher trainings. Yeah. And so Ubud, Ubud would have been out for you because that's too far from the beach. Oh, for sure. Out. Like, and so many teacher trainings in Ubud. And I was mm -hmm. like, yeah, no, I don't want to be in the jungle, which is cool. I want to be able to be by the ocean. And a friend of mine did a post on taking class um, there. And so that's kind of what led me towards it. And again, it wasn't because of the Tantra. I did appreciate that it was, you know, much more focused around meditation and pranayama and mantra. And that side of it felt really in alignment for what I was looking for. I wasn't looking to like learn how to do handstand and things like that, because that was already part of my facility. That was, mm, that came yeah. easy to me, the knowing how to do the body. So that's what really called me to it. And then you know, now, now that's what I seek out. Like after I got that initial foundation of my two and 300 hour trainings, my teachers now are, are all, you know, primarily from, from the lineage of Sri Vidya. So coming from the Himalayan Institute and Pandit Rajmani Tiganayat, who is the, the headmaster of that Institute, it's either learning from him or learning from t students of his that I feel so called to do and just continue to dive deep. You know, it's like, what is that saying that the, you could dig for water and I dig, I dug a hundred holes for the water, but you know, you just needed to dive 
dig one hole all the way deep down and and you'll get it. And so yeah. that's kind of where I'm at now. I'm like, oh, there's a lot of cool things happening out there, but this feels like what I just want to keep diving into and and deepening my practice with. Yeah. And for those who are listening who are interested in yoga or maybe even on the verge of going through a teacher training, um, you offer a 200-hour yoga teacher training. Your next one's coming up in August, which I'm like, I'm really hoping my schedule aligns because I really want to continue to learn from you. Why would you say it's so important for your head teachers of your program to know where their lineage is from, to have a direct, I know my teacher's teacher was this teacher and his teacher's teacher was this teacher. Not a lot of people know that at all. Like at least where I'm practicing and training and also teaching, not a lot of people have a direct understanding. And why do you think that's so important for teachers to have that? It's so true. It's so important and it is hard to find, but it's out there. And I think a lot of people don't even necessarily know to look for that. But what I found in being part of a lineage, it's like you're already being held. Mm. And there's this energy that has been created long before you even knew that you wanted to study something or practice something or chant something that holds you. You know, the practices that I do personally are not just something that you know, I thought were cool or it resonated with because I like the intention behind it. It's like, no, these are the practices that have been practiced millions of times by the teachers before me. And so it's already infused with so much Shakti, so much power that I know I am being held by this mantra or this meditation Kriya or whatever it is that I'm practicing. And I know the ways to get myself there. And even it will pull me back if I kind of go off path a little bit. Yep. We all do. We all do. <laughs> part of life. Human. Yeah, yeah absol- absolutely. And so for me, being part of a lineage just feels like I have this container that's always there, always holding me, always calling me back. And what that gives me is a huge amount of trust in the practices Because I think there's one thing to do the practices, but if you don't really know, like, is this going to work? Is this going to make me feel better or have more peace of mind or whatever it is that you're looking for? And for me, it's like, I have so much deep trust. And when you have that trust, then you can surrender. Then you can let go and say, yes, I will do this 40 day sadhana. Mm -hmm. I will have these herbs. I will, you know, bless my food every time I sit down and eat because I, I have so much belief in and where this is coming from. Yeah, absolutely. I think as well, when you can see the life in which your teachers and their teachers' teachers have lived, which is not always, like you said, it's not always easy. It's not always graceful, but it is, there's so much conviction in the practices that they're doing. I think, like you said, there's so many practices out there. You'll see something on Instagram. You'll see a friend's doing this type of breathing, and then a friend went and did this. And And it can be really easy to get distracted by all the different practices, all the different wellness techniques, everything that's out there. But to be able to see in real life how your teachers or their teachers' teachers' lives have unfolded and the impact that they've created with relative ease because of the practices that they've done to help uplevel their systems, it helps you believe, okay, I like I can see this with my own eyes, how this is directly relating to somebody in my own circle and in today's modern world, which is even harder because sometimes you think my guru, the, you know, there's a guru from India from a hundred years ago and he did this. And he's like, well, that's not the same world as it is now. So yeah, I think I I I 100 percent am in alignment with that. And and I, I think it's important if, if someone's listening who's thinking about doing a yoga teacher training, even if you're not sure if you want to teach, because it's just important to know where these practices are coming from. And like you said, feel really deeply held in the ancient traditions. So you mentioned you mentioned surfing a couple times in that with going to Bali. How has like surfing impacted your or I guess maybe how is it involved in your spiritual practice? Like how has surfing evolved over the course of your life to become what it is now, which it really is truly like part of your spiritual practice, part of your, part of your journey. Mm. Yeah. I feel like when I, I learned to surf when I was little, I was maybe 10 and 12, 13 or something like that. Family trip to Hawaii. My mom's side is from there. So I, I learned my brother and my dad surfed. It was something I was not super into though 
until maybe the last 10 or 11 years. Mm. And so at, at that point, me and my best friend were just like, we're going to become surfers. And we just said every Tuesday, Thursday, we're going to show up to the beach no matter what. We didn't know how to check a surf report. We didn't know much about anything about surfing. And we just did it. We committed to that for like a year and we like just came back with bumps and bruises and cuts all the time because yeah. we were just pumped and going for it. And then, you know, it just became something that that brought me so much childlike joy and just so much stoke as an adult. I think when I turned 30, you think that you're like, oh my gosh, I'm an adult now. Like I'm yeah. old. I'm serious now. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'm serious now, you know? Yeah. And so at, at that time, it felt like it still tethered me to this feeling of like, we're just going to play. And I, I get to do something that's just, just for the hell of doing it today. And that felt really fun. And then now, as I've been surfing for like 10 or 11 years now, I can see so clearly the the connection, maybe that I wasn't, the dots I wasn't putting together before, why, why surfing was so healing for me. Mm. But now it's so easy to see that correlation because I find that what yoga and ultimately what the practice of yoga and meditation does is it, it connects me back to God divine source, whatever you want to call it. It's all the same. And it, it reminds me of my own true nature. So when I'm in that place, everything feels at, at rest and content. And I think that the, a really great access point to that as well is through being in nature. And so that same feeling that I get being in the ocean in this like vast, expanse, deep, unknown space that makes you feel so small and so powerless also makes you feel so limitless too. And when I'm in the ocean, it's that same feeling that I, I can get sitting in meditation of, oh, wow, I'm just so present. I, I'm so connected to everything and I'm just right here and aware and in love. And so now it, it is like surfing can be my spiritual practice in some ways, because I can have that same, that same connection where I just feel so deeply held and and protected and guided. And it's just so fun. <laughs> yeah. I love when you mentioned try when you were just trying something new and you had cuts and bruises and bumps and it's like, yeah, that's, that's what it's like. You got to try something new and you're not going to get it right the first time. I remember my surf coach in Sri Lanka said, I wiped out and I was like, scared to go on the next one. I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. And he was like, there is no surf without the wipeout. That's the way it is. And that's, that's how life is. And I do think yoga and surfing go hand in hand with the sense of surrender, letting go to this bigger power, learning how to be in flow, how to be in the present moment. Because if you're, you know, gliding down the face of a wave and then you start thinking about your grocery list or you start thinking about the fight that you had with your boyfriend, you're not going to make it down that wave in one piece. You have to be present. <laughs> So what I really love is that you combine some of the retreats that you do because you do host international retreats as well. I love that you combine surfing with yoga. And how have you found that people that might not have tried either very much? How, how do you think that's helped your clients transform their own lives just by trying surfing or yoga in combination for the first time? Yeah, I'm super pumped. And next week I leave to Morocco to lead two back-to-back -back surf yoga sound retreats with Cassia Metter and Michaela Smith. And oh, I'm so, so pumped I to know. be able I to I wish share. I could be there. I mean, I'm hosting my own retreat next week, so I'm excited, but I really wish I'll be there at the next one. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. So, you know, it's cool because the surfers, Maybe maybe do yoga, maybe meditate already, but maybe uh, want to go a little bit deeper. And I think that being able to be completely immersed in the whole retreat, where a lot of times I've gone on surf yoga retreats and it's like, we go surfing with the surf people and then we go do yoga with the yoga people and they're not mixing together. Mm. It's like two separate things. There's just like a miss of, of being able to weave both things together, right? That's Tantra is like that weaving of, of it all. And so, you know, I really want to be able to stay really open and present in this retreat so that it doesn't have to feel like this is what I've planned. This is a yoga class I've planned. We're going to do this meditation, blah, blah, blah. Like I think it, it really permits this idea of to go with the flow 
of like, okay, today we surfed and was super fun. We ended up surfing for four hours. Everybody's arms are toast. We're going to go back and you know what? We're going to do a restorative class. I'm going to do some sound healing with you all. Like do something that feels really relaxing. And maybe the next day, oh, the waves were crap. And so we didn't really surf and we're going to have to do something a little bit more rigorous practice wise. I think it's important to have that mental state when you're surfing of being confident and present and calm because the ocean will show you who's boss oh, real yeah. quick. Oh, yeah. And if you're not able to like keep everything chill and quiet when you're just getting tumbled and pounded on, that's not a good place to be in, in the water. So, you know, that that meditation and breath awareness, that side is really great to practice on land when you are safe so that you can carry that into the ocean. And then for the people that are, you know, maybe a little bit more into the yoga stuff, being able to carry that tools that they've already, you know, started to work with and then bring into the ocean and then start to have that sense of fluidity and, and flow on the water and like deepen that inner connection. I think it just goes so, so hand in hand. If you surf, you're going to want to practice yoga and meditate. And if you practice yoga, meditate, you're going to love surfing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it, it seems like a lot of it is harnessing the power that you create within your own self through yoga to kind of release a lot of the fears for if someone who's starting surfing for the first time may not, may not have ever been near the ocean. It really does help bolster your confidence. And also there's like, there's no better feeling in the world than popping up on your board and realizing like, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I, I did it. And the confidence and the camaraderie amongst your group, I think it's just going to be such a beautiful experience for all of your guests. And like I said, I'm as soon as my girls are a little bit older <laughs> and yeah. it, does, it doesn't it does conflict with one of my own, own retreats that I run, I'm a thousand percent going. So I'm really excited for you know our listeners to you know check you out and see all the amazing stuff that you guys are doing. So I would love to hear a little bit like the process for you of bringing all of these passions together. You have your, the yoga, you have the surfing, and now you have the retreats with traveling. Like how, what has that looked like for you in, in constructing this life of, you know, this freedom to choose how you bring all your passions together? Ooh, you know, I think the first, the first thing was I had to get really clear of like what it was that I wanted out of my life. I think for so many years I had my focus dispersed in so many different directions that I didn't know where I wanted to go. Possibilities were endless, and so it felt like I was leaking a lot of energy in a lot of places that I, I didn't really know where, where I wanted to go. And so I think as I got more clear in who I am and what it is I wanted to do to be in service to the world, like what really lights me up? What can I do that is, for me, you know, not everybody is going to have their work be a, a, in alignment with their dharma. And I, I think that's totally okay. Sometimes you are at your job and your your dharma is, you know, taking care of your family or, you know, rescuing dogs or whatever that ends up being. For me, right now at life, in life at least, they're going hand in hand. And what I just saw, like big dream, I'm still getting there. Big dream for me is to own my own retreat center, healing center where, you know, I, I can live half the, half the year and, and run all my things out of and have all my colleagues and friends run their things out of. We'll be but there. Right now, what we'll I- We'll be there. We'll support you. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, my, what five years ago was like, oh, one day, one day I want to run retreats around the world. And one day I want to run a surf, surf retreat with, you know, with somebody so I can do what I love as, as well that I'm doing just right now for pure fun because you know, I'm not, I'm not a competitive surfer. Like I is just for the pure joy of it. And so I just started seeing like what, what was going to make me the happiest. I love to travel. I love to experience new places. I love to be in environments that lend itself to deep connection and conversation with people so that it's beyond just the surface level. It's beyond just like, oh, we're stoked getting waves. Like there's actual depth to what's calling our heart, what's making us feel anxious or sad or, or whatever that we're feeling. And, you know, how can we support one another in our own growth and, and healing? And so as I just kind of started to see that, it was – it has now informed every other choice that I make in my life. Mm. And it 
has required me to get very uncomfortable in a lot of things and, you know, make a lot of sacrifices because what I, what I'm doing is, is still a, a work in progress. It's still building, you know, I I've only been doing this for myself, running my own business for the last like couple years, two, three years, maybe at most. And that's, you know, really only the last year where it's been just, just for myself and not with other business, other, other companies. And so what I've had to do about six months ago, I was like, man, this is a struggle. Like I'm having a really hard time living the life I want to live and eating the way I want to eat and all, all the things, right? And and still doing doing what I love. Like financially, this feels really hard and I'm not quite sure what to do. So I'm not feeling so much stress about how I'm going to pay my mortgage every month and my bills and all of these things. And, you know, that's where I just had to get creative and I had to let go of some of my comforts. And I ended up subletting my condo over the last two months. And then now it will be for another three months. I'm I'm here. I'm home right now for, for two weeks while I'm home and then going to let somebody else enjoy this, this sanctuary for a while. And, you know, that that was like a big decision to move all of my stuff out to, you know, when I am home, a lot of the times I'm living out of my van. Yeah. And... But you know what? When I thought of that idea, it just was like this huge weight lifted off my shoulders, like a big exhale. It was like, oh, this is what I need to do. As much as I love the comforts of my home and cooking for myself every day and this that ease of, of doing that, yeah. I, I knew what I wanted, my what where I'm going with, with being able to be this yoga teacher, retreat facilitator, and letting that be what is my primary source of income. I knew I needed to make some adjustments for a little while. And I can see why a lot of people don't do that because it was really hard. Like as I was moving my stuff out, I was like, this is hard. How am I going to find somebody looking for somebody? And then coming home and for a week I was living in my van and it was hard. Like it was very, you know, hard to stay grounded and centered. And, you know, right now in my life I'm single and I don't have kids. And so I have that that freedom to just choose me in every situation for the most part. Mm. And yeah, I think, I think to me, that's like a really big lesson is that when you want something, what are you really willing to sacrifice to get it? And that's kind of what's shown me the way as I navigate life right now. Yeah. I mean, I really, I appreciate the vulnerability and the candid, the candidness of that because a lot of times you'll hear, I'm a mom, I have two kids. A lot of the times you'll hear with moms say, you know, you can't have it all, but you know, you got to figure out what your all means right now. Right. And it's like, it actually, it doesn't apply just to moms. It applies to everyone. It applies to somebody who wants to, you know, go after their dreams. It applies to somebody who wants to travel across the world. It applies to somebody who wants to have kids. Like there's always a sacrifice that you have to make. And not many people are talking about the sacrifices that they made to get to where they are. It looks great mm-hmm. on Instagram and everyone thinks you're living the best life ever, which not mm-hmm. 90% of the time it feels like that, but it's life. And, and there are times that feel like a sacrifice and feel like a challenge. So I appreciate the honesty in that. And I would love to hear a little bit about van life, what that was like for you. I know you did an extended period of time living out of your van and surfing. And of course, on Instagram, from my perspective, it looks glorious. And I'm sure, like I said, 90% of the time it felt that way. But I'd love to hear like the process of getting your van set up and what that was really like for you on a day-to-day basis. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm looking at my van right now. It's just parked out the window. Oh. So. <laughs> What's her name? Uh, her name is Agnia or Ajna, oh. the oh. name of the sixth chakra. She's my intuition when I'm on the road. I just trust, trust that we're going to be safe and we're going to go the right way. Yeah. So, you know, I had this vision for many, a little while, many years before I was able to save up enough and, and get the van built out and do all of that. You know, I had the plan and I don't know how to build anything and did not trust myself to do that. So I hired somebody to, to build that out for me in, you know, during pandemic time, COVID time, I was living primarily out of the van and kind of popping into my parents' house and doing laundry and having a home-cooked meal every once in a while. And then now as I'm subletting my condo, same thing. It's like I have the van to kind of come back to and that's that's home. And it's been I it's been great. It's an adventure. Like I really do love the van. 
like I'll go stay with people and like visit friends up and down the coast. And they'll be like, you know, you can stay in the house. Like we've got a spare bedroom. And I'm like, no, I'm good. I actually really like being in the van because it's my, it's my home. It's my like safe space where I have all the things that I need right there in it. You know, I have my pillow. I have like the candle that I light. Everything is just right in you know, arm's reach distance because it's a very small space. And, you know, I think that's also what what is a reason why I can travel and kind of be all over the places because it just requires a few, you know, key things to keep me feeling grounded. You know, it's like I just need a place to hot boil water so I can like make my tea and oatmeal. If I could do that, that's going to take care of a lot of stuff on the physical side of things. You know, if I can have like a candle or a piece of Palo Santo or something with my, well, maybe a my tiny little deity and my mala, like that can keep me grounded as far as my spiritual practice goes. You know, if I just got a little sink to scrape my tongue and brush my teeth, it's just so simple what, what we really need. And, and yeah, I just, I, I love the, the freedom of it that it gives me to just go anywhere and go to places that I normally wouldn't maybe go to and meet people that I wouldn't normally meet. And there's definitely times where it's a pain in the butt. And I'm like, man, I just would like to go take a shower in my shower and use the bathroom and sleep in my bed and cook a meat dinner in my kitchen. You know, it requires a lot more effort to like bring out the stove and to do all the things. But it also, you know, it just gives me gives me that 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 freedom, that space to to really feel like oh, I can I can go anywhere, I can do anything. Yeah, the like you just mentioned, the freedom, the freedom of the simplicity, and you realize how little you actually need to to feel good. Like oftentimes, the more that we take away a lot of the distractions in our life, the the more freedom, the more light we feel, the more spaciousness that we feel because we've literally created space. From not having to like carry all this stuff with us all the time. One of the beautiful things about traveling, like whether that's in my van or going to Bali, is like when you have less choices, it frees up space for more energy to think about other things, right? You're like, these are the three clothes, the outfits that I have to wear. And this is where I will sleep. I only have this to eat. So if you crave something else, like you can't just go get it. This is it. Yeah. yeah <laughs> so I think like having the less choice sometimes makes life easier. Yeah, for sure. And um, mm -hmm. you mentioned a couple things that you do keep in your van, although it's a small space and you can only have a couple things on you. You mentioned the tongue scraper and you mentioned a couple other Ayurvedic, mm. Ayurvedic principles. So could you explain to people, one, what Ayurveda is, very you know short 101 Ayurveda, and then two, what are some of the like really easy, simple Ayurvedic principles or techniques like the tongue scraping that they could add into their life, even when they're traveling to stay grounded and stay healthy. Yeah. So Ayurveda is, Ayur means life. Veda is knowledge. And so it's the science of life and it's really tuning into the cycles of nature and to feel that alignment in where you're at and what you're doing so that you can have the tools to create a life that you love and that loves you back. So that's what Ayurveda has done for me. And one side of Ayurveda is these purification practices, these cleansing rituals. You know, Ayurveda is all about increasing the clarity of your senses. So your smell, your sight, your touch, your hearing, your taste, like if those can be more clear, then we're so much more online and we're really more sensitive to, to the environment, which sometimes you know, can be challenging as well, but it just offers so much more beauty, I think, of life when we're not looking at it from the lens of being foggy and tired and not not having the ability to really taste life, right? Yeah, the fullness, the fullness of life. Yeah. Exactly. And so, you know, one of the things that we can do is dinacharya. And so dinacharya is these daily rituals, our daily routines that we can do to keep our senses really clear and to keep ourselves connected to how we feel. And so that hopefully we make the best choices throughout the rest of the day to honor where we're at in that moment. And so one simple thing that I encourage everyone to do is to, to scrape their tongue in the morning. You know, it, it, if, 
you don't have a tongue scraper, you could actually use the back of a metal spoon and, and use mm. that. And just by looking in the mirror and looking at your tongue, you could already kind of see how much toxins are on your tongue. You know, at night we sleep and we excrete our toxins through the tongue is one of the ways that we can expel that. And so in the morning, it's important for us to scrape that off so that we don't swallow it. And then the body's like, oh, really? We got to do it all over again? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we can get that out. And, you know, you can look at it. You can see like, oh, wow, there's a lot of film coming off of it. A lot of omelet today. What did I eat yesterday? What did I do? How did I sleep? It's this color or it's white or it's yellow or gray. Like it starts to already be like, oh, I think I'm a, a little bit out of balance with my my kappa. So I'm going to try to maybe eat a little bit less dairy today and heavy meats and things like that because I could see that that's already out of balance. Mm. So it's just so informative, I think, just doing that, that tongue scraping. And after that, it's also, you know, there's you can also do the oil pulling, swish some some oil in the mouth. That's also a really great Dinacharya practice. Dry brushing, you know, Abhyanga oil massage. Like there's, there's many, many different things that we can do. But, you know, when I'm in the van and it's like, I can't, I'm not going to get to do all those things. My oil's not getting heated up. Like, yeah. so, so that's kind of the primary one that I will stick to. And then, you know, getting warm water in my belly first thing before anything else is also very, very helpful. Ayurveda says all disease stems from the the gut, from digestion. And so if we're digesting well, then everything else starts to work well. So for me, I found that warm water, first thing, is going to be really soothing. And and then, you know, fingers crossed everything else continues to go well from there. But those those two things, I think drinking warm water before your coffee, before your juice, before whatever it is that that you have – can really, really change, especially if you're having things like IBS or heartburn or bloating, gas, constipation, like all of these things that we could feel sluggish after we, we eat can start to be, you know, fixed and healed yeah. from, from just that little, little shift. So those, those would be my two simple things. And I'm leading a, a fall cleanse in October. So if anyone wants to learn more, that would be a deeper dive and, and an invitation to do uh, a seven-day Ayurvedic cleanse and and learn a lot of the different tools that I think keep me in balance when I'm traveling and reach towards options that are going to benefit me for my dosha, my constitution, wh- where I'm at today, rather than always being the same. Yeah, I think that could be a really great way if if somebody's listening and it's like, this sounds interesting. What do you mean eat for your dosha? And what is a dosha and all that stuff? Yep. Like, we'll go really deep into, into that that workshop where we'll we'll learn and you'll cook for yourself and you'll understand how to take some of those tools away into the rest of your life. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll link to that fall cleanse in the show notes so people can see all, or at least to your website, so people can see all the information there, because that is just like the smallest of the small snippets that of the amazing, you know, juiciness that is Ayurveda that you can learn from Nikki, from you. And I really love that because when it's really accessible, you can find water everywhere. I mean, you're not going to travel somewhere that you can't find at least, at the very least, bottled water that you can heat up for the warm water. And then Tongue scraper, scraper is super small. You could fit it into your toiletries. So that's really easy too. So I love those two tips. So the very last thing that I'd like to kind of wrap up with is just, you've traveled all over the place. You've lived in Bali. You've run retreats. I know you did a retreat down in Mexico. You're going to Morocco for retreats. Half of your family's from Hawaii. So you really do have like a good sense of what the world has to teach you and has to offer to you. And I'd love to hear like, what's the biggest thing that you've really learned about yourself through traveling and through kind of surrendering to life's plan that's kind of unfolded for you? Hmm. You know, I had a moment when I was in Bali because I was just there. I just got back like a week and a half ago. And so where I was, I think I was walking around Lombok. I went to an island next to Bali for a, a surf trip. And I was like, whoa, I'm really brave. <laughs> yeah. I'm really brave. Like I'm here I'm on my own. I travel a lot alone, even though, you know, I'll meet up with people there, but I travel a lot alone. And I had a moment where I was like, this is, this is really awesome that I, I have this trust in myself that I will be okay, that I will make the right choices and be present and like keep my head up and be respectful of the cultures. And I think, you know, 
when you travel, it can be scary, especially as a woman, especially alone. Mm. And and stuff happens, you know. I, I've I've seen it in 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 Bali and in all over the world where people get robbed or you know get hurt and and things like that. And I think a big part of what has kept me safe through all my travels is is staying very very conscious with my actions and what I'm doing and being really present to the situation and being really in tune with my intuition and that feeling you get when something doesn't feel right, that person doesn't feel like I should trust them and and be, being very strong about the choices to say no to certain things and and also to to be open for the possibilities that can exceed your expectations. And so I've been very, very lucky to to meet some amazing people through my travels. And one thing about traveling alone, it just really affords you the space to connect with other people. When you sit alone at a restaurant, all of a sudden you're like talking to this person next to you. And, you know, when you're going on a surf trip with somebody, you're like, oh, we're going to all be together and be homies this week. And, you know, I think that has really brought me so much joy and contentment with where I am at right now, at least in my life. Sure, I would love to have a partner and somebody to travel around with and to make me feel safe, but I'm going to be able to find that in myself so that when I do find that man, like he doesn't have to be the the reason why I, I am doing the things I'm doing or not doing. And then another big thing is just, is just respect. You know, a lot of the times when you travel to other places, it's just, just being respectful of how they do things, even if you don't agree with it. Mm-hmm. You know, like yeah. that's it's, a, a, it's a Muslim culture in Lombok, and so yeah, the women, you know, the women are all all covered in their hijab and and aren't allowed to do certain things, and that's not my place to say, ah, come on, you know, it's yeah. like, yeah. no, I'm gonna actually be more covered, and I'm gonna I'm not gonna ride my scooter in a bikini. I will respect that this culture that that's not that's yeah, not their norm okay yeah. for them, yeah. Yeah. And so I think it's it's important to be able to, again, be flexible, be pliable, to be adaptable in these situations and to look around and be like, oh, every woman right now is is covered up. And I think I'm I'm gonna just put my sarong over my shoulders or whatever that is. And gosh, every everybody is like super smiley and kind and loving right now. Like I'm gonna just let myself say yes to this situation and 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 then relax a little bit and hang out and you know, really being able to read that again, it goes back to like that importance of of having a spiritual practice and being in tune with yourself so that you can feel when things are funky and go to go to away from those places and towards the, the places that make you feel safe and, and warm inside. I 100% agree with especially the respect side of things. I remember when we were in India and it was, I mean, I wore, I wore dresses, but I would wear long sleeves under my dresses that were long. They were past my knee. And we were mainly in the North. We weren't down in like Goa where they're a little more free, I guess you could say, but it was very clear when there was a Taurus and they did not care (laughs) like that there was, there were societal norms to be kept there. You could see all the Indian men, all the Indian women basically pointing, like straight up pointing at the girl in the short shorts and the tank top. So like you said, it's just about like being conscious and being present to what's going on around you. And what you Mm -hmm. mentioned, I think the third thing you mentioned was around that self-love and, and being brave and doing things on your own because you want to do them. And it kind of all seems like the very first thing we talked about was how yoga helped you bridge the gap between your confidence and your self-love. And now traveling is also enabling that sense of self-love for yourself as well. So I think that's a really powerful awareness to have about yourself and also really powerful awareness for people listening who might be a little bit afraid to go out on their own or maybe their friends or their partners or their family members don't want to travel with them. There's so much that you can learn about yourself and so much that you can recognize within yourself while you travel. And I think that's been such a beautiful part of your journey. And I I appreciate you for sharing that. So the very last thing that I do is I end the episodes with short like travel pop quiz basically about your top favorite things. So Number one is if you could only go back to one country, place, or town in the world, where would it be and why? Oh, man. I think because Bali is just so fresh on my heart and yeah. I have such great community there. It, and I see myself going back there a lot. I think that's, that's what I'll say for today. Where, where's your go-to in Bali? What part of the island do you like going to? I really like going to Uluwatu. 
Yeah. Home was was Chengu though for a while, so I still have a special place in my heart there. Yeah, I love Ulu as well. It's such a cool little spot. Um, okay, then number two is what is number one on your bucket list right now? Mm, India. I haven't been to India yet, and I really am called to go there, study Ayurveda, to study with my teacher. So I know that's that's in the making. Even as I say it out loud, I'm like, yeah, it's it's happening. Oh yeah, I can feel that. (laughs) Where in India is your teacher based? Oh my gosh, I can't think of where the Himalayan Institute shrine is there. You know, until you've actually like had your feet in the ground there, it everything kind of just feels like. So far it's like away, far away land. I, I mean, I, I spent five weeks there, and it still feels that way. Like I'm like, wait, did that really happen? Did I? Was it just a portal that I jumped through? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Also, so number three, we kind of touched on this with this last question, but your number one biggest life lesson through travel. Mm, yeah. Number one biggest life lesson. I mean, I, I, it is love yourself. Love yourself first in in every situation, and you will be led down the right path. Mm. Oh, that's a good one. And number four, if you could give a piece of advice to an aspiring explorer, someone who is just ready to get going, but they're not sure how to go yet, what would be your biggest piece of advice for them? Yeah. Take the leap. Like feel that it's a very, you know, interesting double-sided coin of that fear and excitement. Mm. And I would just say, you know, go for it. When you start to feel that call to travel, a lot of work primarily with women and a lot of women will reach out to me before they go on retreat. And it's like, I've never gone out of the country by myself or even, you know, done anything like this. Like what am, I don't know if I should do it. And I think that, that the big thing is that nobody regrets it afterwards. Everybody's like, I can't believe I haven't done this before. And I think the more that we do things that make us feel uncomfortable, that have a lot of unknowns to them, that leads us to play in the field of growth and of expansion and to do more of that, mm. you know? doesn't have to be all the time, but get uncomfortable, to be adaptable, to be flexible, and, and to leave space for possibility, you know, not to be so attached to your expectation of everyone and everything and, and to be open to explore. Oh, that's so beautiful. I love when you said to play in the field of growth and expansion. I think that's just, I got goosebumps when you said that. So beautiful. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story and for sharing just so much wisdom. We we really touched on a wide range of topics in this episode, which is like my favorite conversations because that's just, I always love to dive deep in a million different things. So for people who are listening that are like, I need to connect with her. She sounds rad. How can people connect with you online and just what are the upcoming things? What's what's next for Nikki Me? Yeah, I would say just go follow me on Instagram. That's a really easy direct way to message with me. I'm Nikki, N-I-K-K-I underscore N-I-E underscore. And from there, you can find Wavelength Movement, which is my on-demand platform where I have yoga practices, workouts, sound healings, mantras, yoga philosophy on there that you can you can do at any time. And I lead a monthly moon gathering there, which is actually happening tonight. Oh. I, I, lead, I lead that on there once a month. It's just a way to have sangha, to have community and connection. So once you go there, then you can be led to my website, which is nikkini.com. You can find all of the ways to work with me, whether that is one-on-one Ayurvedic coaching or going into my Lahari 200-hour Tantra Katha yoga training or, you know, doing my fall cleanse retreats. I'm doing rewild my women's sound and voice activation retreat with my friend Kate in, in May. And yeah, just being able to, to stay in touch in all the ways. More retreats will be announced as soon as they are planned. The teacher training will be announced as soon as that is, is on the books, but it will be in Bali in 2024. It's a half online, half in person. So we do two months online and two weeks in person. Oh, and amazing. yeah, those are the, the main ways right now to, to stay connected and to, to practice and to play. Awesome. So everyone, please go rush over to her website, get all the information. And I'm so excited. Just continue to, sh- to follow your journey. And who knows, maybe one day we'll collaborate on a retreat one day, bring the best of both worlds together. And I just appreciate you taking the time to share with us. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Kelly. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Transform with Travel podcast. 
Don't forget to hit subscribe so you never miss an episode of inspiration, adventure, and exploration. If you felt inspired by this episode, please rate and review in whatever streaming app you're listening from. This allows us to spread the word even more and continue to serve up weekly doses of adventure. As always, we'd love if you could share the episode with someone in your life who you think will benefit from this conversation. Thanks so much for listening. This is your reminder to get out there and keep on exploring.